Right, so today um, we'll be looking at um, chapter 28, a field guide to BASAR. Um, and, and there's ba basically we've, we have been using R all the time, but a lot of what we've been doing, as it said here, is that, um, you know, really it's been concentrating on the tidyverse as a nice consistent way of working with data problems. Um, and so that there are certain things in BASAR that we've already been doing without really thinking about it. Um, but we're going to look at some of the big um, topics for BASAR um, without using the tidyverse, and also a bit of a look at how, how they compare with what we've been doing within the tidyverse. So the, the four main things are going to be just subsetting data um, with the square brackets and also using dollar. Um, we'll be looking at the apply family of functions and for loops. Um, and then we'll finally have a look at basic plotting in base R as well, which, um, you know, it's, it's not the same as in ggplot, it's much simpler. Um, so it can be nice just to quickly pull together a rough plot without all the, the sort of tidying up you can do in, um, in ggplot. Okay, having said we're not looking at tidyverse, um, for the purposes of the chapter, we kind of are going to load it into the library just so we can see how some of the things compare. And I think the best way, if we start looking at multiple elements using the square brackets, is just to um, basically run it here. So um, if we have a, a vector of positive integers, so here's a vector of positive integers x, um, we can subset that just by using a positive integer to call the element at the position we refer to. So here we're going to actually call x from positions 3, 2 and 5, which should give us 3, 4 and 5. No, 3, 2 and 5. So there we go, we've got 3, 2 and 5 um, by running that. And if we repeat any position, we actually call the same thing twice. So you can actually end up with a larger set than you subsetted from. Similarly, we can, um, with the same vector, use a negative um, integer to actually drop the, um, the elements at those positions. So if we get minus one, minus three, minus five, we're actually dropping those from those positions, so we should be left with two and four. So when I run that, you can see we get two and four. And you can use that number as many times as you like, but it makes no difference. So whereas when we repeated a positive integer, we'd actually get duplicate values. Once you've dropped the first element, you can only drop it once. So it has no additional effect. Okay, so um, I'll move on to logical vectors. So if we get another set, another vector, which has um, these values here in it, we can say, select everything that isn't NA in X. And there we get 10, 3, 5, 8, 1, but we've not got the NA values. One interesting thing with using the square brackets as well if we try looking at everything that um, is even so you divide it by two with no remainder you can see in this case we've got 10 and 8 which we expected but actually it's also bringing back um, NA number values as well um, which you might expect to be dropped so if we compare that to how it works with a data frame so if I just produce a data frame duplicating the values of x as x and y, and then filter using the same parameters. You can see I, I, it doesn't bring back the NAs. So filtering removes NAs on those parameters, but using the square brackets to subset actually leaves NAs in. So, so they behave a little bit differently. Um, you can subset with character vectors. So if you actually give columns a name, you can do exactly the same thing. And rather than referring to the position of, 
of each um, character. You can actually use the column title. So there we brought back everything for X, Y, Z and D, E, F. So we get five and two. And if we put nothing in, that returns everything, <laughs> which is kind of maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but you can see by putting X without everything in, it's just given us everything that was in X to start with. Okay, so that's subsetting vectors. Uh, is that all pretty clear? Any comments on that before we move on? Yes, I think it's clear, but the comments is uh, the line 48, where is, you have X, then square brackets, you did not put anything, but it's very, <laughs> very, very interesting that it still returns everything that is in that vector. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't, it's not dropping anything, is it at all? Yeah, good. Um, okay, so if that's okay, I'll move on to um, subsetting data frames. So up till now, we've just been looking at simple vectors. If I quickly just, oops, I'll look at the book as well, just to make sure we're going through the right thing. What have we got here? So subsetting data frames. Um, so you can subset from data frames in various ways, but um, the most important, which we're going to look at, is going to be actually using rows and columns to identify what you want to keep. And obviously each row or each column is a vector, exactly as the vectors we were looking at before were. And if you actually leave either the rows or columns blank, you're just going to get the vector of rows or columns, depending on which you leave blank. So if we just nip back into R to look at those, we can create a data frame here or a tibble um, with those values in it. So if we have a quick look at what we've got in there. So X is one, two, three, A, E, F in Y. And then we've just got three random numbers in Z. Okay. Um, so if we do D, F, one, two, or if we do that, of course, what we get is everything, pretty much the same as with vectors. So if you just claim TF with nothing in there, that gives you the lot. Whereas if you put anything in there, you're actually going to start subsetting. So if we look at one comma two, you can see what we've brought back is Y and A. So it's brought back the first row of the second column, basically, is what we've got. Um, you can select all rows and columns x and y so by leaving a comma a blank before the comma there's nothing before the comma that's not subsetting the rows at all but we're just selecting columns x and y you can see we've got columns x and y and the values from those columns okay you can also use um, logical statements so here we're going to get all rows where x is greater than one and we're not subsetting on columns at all, so we'll get all the columns back, uh, which is actually it's very similar to what we would have done in tidyverse. If we run that, you can see filter df where x is greater than one gives us exactly the same answer as we had before. Okay, but if you subset a data frame, if you only end up with a single column left, you're going to get a vector that's returned. So if we look at this value, df1 data frame of x1 to 3, so that actually, can I, I can't actually view that. Yeah, I can. There we go. You can see we've actually got a data frame of only one column. So if we subset that now, you can see we don't have a data frame anymore. We've just got a vector, a list of basically a, a, a vector of numbers. Um, whereas if we created an identical tibble, so if we look at DF2, it's pretty much identical to DF1, but now it's a tibble. And if we subset that in exactly the same way, because it was a tibble, we're going to get a tibble back. So kind of, you know, there's a bit to think about there in terms of the structure your data's in, 
might affect what you get back, even though you're doing exactly the same subsetting operations. Okay, if you are subsetting a data frame and you still want to keep it as a data frame, you can do that. Um, you just have to put drop equals four. So you can override that default behavior of changing the structure of it by asking it not to drop any columns or anything. So we still kept the data as, as a data frame. Okay, so um, if we just quickly go through that, that's basically what we were just running through there, avoiding the ambiguity. So that, that really is just a quick overview of the different ways of subsetting um, data frames or vectors. Um, is that all okay before I move on and look at the dplyr equivalents? Yeah, I think it's okay. I think Joyce, move on. Yeah, good, good. Um, so basically we've already looked briefly at using filter to compare the operations, but if we create a tibble, df. So if we look at df now, you can see we've got a tibble with those values in. And then we can use filter and that's doing exactly what we were doing above with, um, with subsetting. So you can sub, basically, if we run this, it'll do exactly the same thing. So we're getting all of the columns back but we're only looking at rows where X is greater than one and where it's not NA. Because if you remember earlier on, we said that subsetting in this way would return NAs. So to reproduce that in BASAR, we actually have to specify that we don't want NA values. So there you go, we've got exactly the same answer with that. Um, whereas if we take out but obviously we'll still get the NA values now. So there you go, you've got the NA values for the third row, um, which is again VASAR, and that does remove NAs by default. So we can achieve the same thing as we did with the filter command by using which um, DF dollar X is greater than one. Okay, arrange is another command that um, is used in tidyverse. So if we arrange by X and Y, you can see we've got ascending X um, and we haven't got ascending Y actually. <laughs> um, so basically because X, yeah, we have, we've got ascending Y where X is one, it's putting the C before the D. So we're ascending X and Y in that arrangement. And you can do exactly the same thing with the order by, so df, we're subsetting and we're ordering by column x and column y. So that again produces exactly the same results. So we've got sort of comparable um, effects operations we can get either using tidyverse commands or by using base r. Um, you can use order decreasing equals true. That would also sort all the columns in the same way, but in descending order. Um, and both select and relocate are similar to subsetting columns with a character vector. So if we go down here, if we go to data frame, we can select, so this is tidyverse, and we've just selected columns X and Z, and that is identical to subsetting all the rows, but just from columns X and Z. So that's done exactly the same thing, basically. Um, similarly, we can um, use combine filter and select in an operation called subsetting. So if we were to subset where X is greater than one and then select columns Y and Z, you can see we've got columns Y and Z um, for those rows where X is greater than one, but it's not actually brought X back, it's just used it in the filter operation. 
and we can do exactly the same thing um, subsetting in this way. So we're taking the data frame and we're subsetting where X is greater than one and selecting columns Y and Z um, by name there. So if we run that, that also does exactly the same as above. Okay, so um, before I have a quick look at some of the exercises, any comments or questions there? Uh, there is no comments, I think you can go ahead. Yeah, keep going on, good, good. Uh, so for the exercises, we have to look at functions that take a vector as an input and return various things. So if we, if we had a, a vector, as an input. So just generating a vector X and creating a function even rows as a function of X. Um, what we've got is we want X subsetting for row numbers of X. Um, we're dividing by two leaves no remainder and also removing is NA of X. So that's generated a function. So if I run that function now, I've just got the even rows, two, four, six, eight, ten. which if we look at X, um, those are in the even numbered position of rows. So I've not actually filtered on the numbers contained in those rows. I've actually used the row number. Um, you can do every element apart from the last value. So I've got except last. So it's subsetting four X where the row number of X isn't the maximum row number of X. So that should just leave me the very last row number. Oops. That's not, yeah, every element except the last value. So we've got one to nine, but we've left 10. Um, then we've got, only even values without missing values. We've got only even. So again, we're removing the NAs and selecting for even values. So if I run that function, you can see we're only getting even values back. Okay, and then that I actually tried running it. Um, and it, you kind of get the same answer. So I'm not, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure why it's different. I, I don't, do you know on UFME why these are different? So if I run that, oh, it's, it's, so we're getting a numeric value, oh, great, X. So we've, we're basically removing everything where X is greater than naught. So we're not actually bringing back anything at all. But they're kind of, to me, they look like they're returning the same thing. So not too sure on that one. Okay, I'll go on to um, data frames. So if we go back to the book exercises and we could look at so up till now we've been subsetting for multiple elements but we can also in the same way select single elements either by using um, dollar to actually bring back a named element or by using doubled up square brackets we can actually extract a single element um, and we'll have a look at a couple more differences between data frames and tibbles and looking um, at some of the important differences between these ways of subsetting when you're using lists. So if I go back to the book. So if we have a tibble where x is one to four um, and y, you take the four, those four values within that vector there, 
you can subset by position. So you can get the first value from that first row, which is X one to four. So that's just brought back that row. You can bring column X back. So we're actually doing it by name. Um, and also by using dollar X and however you do it, you get exactly the same um, results. Let's just see, have I got that in there? So if I go back up here, yeah, so I can run those. And you can see that's basically exactly what, what we were saying in the book. However we choose to do that, we get exactly the same result. We can create new columns. So we could, in Tidyverse, we'd have used mutate to create a new column. Here, you can actually create a new column. We create a new data frame uh, or tibble, a column called Z by combining columns X and Y. So if we run that, that should just add those values. So we can see we've got, if we run this as well. So if we look at our tibble now, there you are, we've got a column Z, which is the column sum of columns X and Y. So that seems to work okay. And then if we go back to the book for a minute, it also explains that um, there are many other base R approaches to creating new columns, which, which they don't look at, but there is a link here which um, you can look at if you want to look at other ways of creating new columns using those different um, commands within base R. And also dollar does allow us to very quickly provide summaries. So I think I've done this within here. So say if you wanted maximum value of carrot, in the data set of diamonds, you can just do maximum diamonds, dollar carat. You can see the levels of cut. You know, and again, if we look at this one, diamonds, dollar cut, basically if we group by cut and summarize, you can see we actually get pretty much the same answers, though a slightly different structure. This is returning um, a vector. This is actually returning what looks like a data frame with um, the orders used within that. Um, you can also use pull as a way of just choosing one column, so if, which again is base R, diamond, pull, carrot, and then performing a mean on that using pipe operators. Provides us with a mean and we can do the same thing to retrieve the levels. So um, nice and simple ways of getting basic summary information, um, just using simple subsetting and then, you know, mean or, or other values that we might want to look at. And if we go back to the book just to look at tibbles. Okay, so there are some important differences in the um, the way that they behave. So data frames match the prefix of any variable names. And also you don't get any error warnings if columns don't exist. So if we go back here. So if we create a data frame. And then subset on X, you see the column's actually called X1, but we, we just asked for X, but it's brought back the value for X1. So it's done that partial matching. And then if we try and ask it for a column that's not there, it actually just brings back a null value. So it goes away, looks for what it can find and brings it back. In this case, there's nothing there, so we get null. So as a data frame, it's actually quite happily dealing with incomplete information and returning null values if we expect 
if we look for something that doesn't exist. If we do exactly the same thing with a tibble, you can see there isn't a column called X and it's just saying there isn't a column called X. Um, whereas if we run it for X1, that should make it happy. So there you go, for X1, it recognizes it. So it's not doing the partial matching that it did with data frames. And again, if we ask for a column that doesn't exist, it's just telling us um, that the column doesn't exist. So the book tells us about the, the little joke that tibbles are lazy and surly, they do less and complain more, which on the face of it might not be a good thing, but it, it does, um, help us avoid problems in some ways. So they might not be quite as flexible, but they do tend to make us stricter on the way we handle our data. Um, if we look at lists, go back to the book. We can also work with lists by using double square brackets or dollar. Um, and we'll have a look also at how it differs from using single brackets. And again, I prefer doing this in R. So if we generate a list, we've got, um, so we've got three objects. Now, where's that? A list of four different things. So the first is numbers one to three. We've got a character string. We've got the constant pi and then a list of numbers between minus one and minus five. So if we look at trying, if we try and extract some of those things, so if we use single brackets and just extract one and two, you can see we brought back the first two elements, the first two in that list, a vector of numbers and a character string, which are the first two things in the list. Um, and we can just bring those things back in exactly the same way. Okay, if we look at a structure of list item one, that's a list of one. Structure of list item four is again, it's a list of two things, just the number minus one and the number minus five. So go back to the book. If you use square brackets, basically, you're always getting a list back. So if, you, if we use that string command, we're getting a list of two items. We use that command with square brackets, we're getting a list of one item. So every time we're extracting from the list, we're getting another list back. Um, whereas if we use double brackets, we will actually get a single component from that list. So um, if we compare that now, so if we look at, if we remind ourselves actually what we got back when we just did, S, what's this command, str1, we got that up there. No. Okay, so we'll just we'll just do this. So if you do the single brackets, that's bringing you back the first item, a list, which is the first item in that list of lists. Whereas if we actually use double square brackets, we're getting the integers one to three. So using the single brackets brought back a list, but using double brackets has brought back a vector of integers. So the values are the same, but the structure of the data we're bringing back is different. If we look at the fourth item here, using the double square brackets has brought back the two numbers as a list. And if we compare L dollar A, that's bringing back a vector of integers. If we use 
single square brackets, that's bringing a list of one item. Okay, and there's a little example in the book, which to be honest, kind of makes it easier to see, but is also a little bit confusing as well in some ways. So if you think of your list of things as being a pepper pot, um, so the list is pepper, and if we used a single square bracket on the first item, it's bringing back a single pepper packet. Sorry, I've skipped a bit, haven't I? If the list is pepper, then pepper, single square brackets one, is a pepper shaker containing a pepper bracket. So we brought back the first element in that list. And then pepper two would just bring back a different packet of pepper, so but it would look exactly the same. Um, one to two would be two pepper packets. But if we did pepper with double square brackets on the first item, we've actually extracted one item from the pepper pot and then we've extracted it from the pot itself. So you just get the item. So it's you're kind of removing um, layers of um, the list each time with that. And, and you can also um, use the same principle if you're working with a data frame. So a single bracket returns a single column of a data frame, whereas double brackets returns a vector. So you kind of need to be a bit careful about how you subset the data and be quite clear on the structure of data you want to bring back. Okay, D does that make sense, Alia Femi? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's okay, you can go ahead. Yep, okay, thank you very much. And then th this next bit really, we're looking at the apply function, which is, is getting back towards, um, I think some of the iterations that we were looking at last week. So apply will apply a function over every element of a vector. So it's um, it's a way of performing iterations basically without using a loop. Um, so you've got L apply. Well, let's have a quick look at if we look at question mark apply. So basically it returns a vector or array of list values by applying a function um, to margins of an array or matrix. Uh, somewhere I thought if I did this, it would tell me about the different types. No, it's not. Okay, sorry, it's not done what I thought it would. I was hoping for a list of the different members of the apply family but it's it's not actually given me them um, but the most important member is l apply which is very similar to map um, which is in the tidyverse um, and in fact we've only briefly looked at map and haven't used any of its advanced features so they're pretty much interchangeable um, we, there's nothing in base r that's exactly like a cross but you can get do something similar by subsetting using square brackets with L apply. Um, and basically it says, you know, this is working because under the hood, a data frame is basically just a list of columns. So you can actually use L apply um, to apply the function to each column. So here it's actually looking at S apply and it's selecting everything from the data frame where or it's, it's doing a logical operation and it's returning the, the result of is numeric. So if you look at one, two, A, B, four, ask the question, is it numeric? We get true, true, false, false. So A and B aren't numeric. So S apply is returning a false value for the non-numeric value. So it's looking all over 
for all of the num columns or, or for everything all of the columns in the data frame it's actually just asking the same question over and over again we've not had to tell it which column to apply to it's just done it to each one um, we could also then transform each column with l apply then replace the original values of the data frame so if we go to if we select num columns so all those columns where it's a numeric value you can l apply um, a second function to that um, so you can actually take x and multiply it by two so what this has done is it's taken all of the numeric values and now it's doubled them and you can see we actually used s apply or sapley rather than lapley um, they're similar um, but sapley actually tries to simplify the result so you actually end up with a logical vector instead of a list it's it's reducing the complexity of the um of the data it brings back so um it's not advised in programming because the simplification might fail you might get um, an unexpected type of data back but if you're working interactively with data it's great because you can kind of see what's going on as you go it also mentions here a similar function called mapfec which um, is also within per and we hadn't looked at before there's also v apply which is a bit like s apply but you can tell it exactly what type of data you expect back so um, in this case we've used v apply we're still using is numeric but we're now telling the function that we want a logical value back so um, you, we're, we're specifying how we want the answer back so it's more reliable it's not going to do anything unexpected um, so there you go it makes a big difference to, to robustness because um, you're less likely to get um, unusual outputs when you get unusual inputs um, we've also got t apply or taply which computes a singled grouped summary so if we look at um, diamonds group guy cut and then summarize the price on mean price you can see we've got the type of cut and the mean price for each cut um, and you can see if we use taply on diamonds dollar price and diamonds dollar cut and asking for the mean you can see it's grouped by cut and then calculated the mean of the price in the same way now one question i had here are you are you are you there No, okay, okay. Um, but what, one, one thing that is slightly different between these is that um, Tapley is not rounding the mean value, whereas mean used with group by and summarize is actually providing, is rounding it to, um, to the nearest whole number in this case. Also, because Tapley returns its result in a named vector, it can be a little awkward to use. So, um, we've got um, a bit of work to do if we want to do multiple summaries and groupings of variables in a data frame it's possible but it can be tricky and there's an article linked here in the book um, where Hadley has collected different techniques for doing this there's also a map something called apply which works with matrices and arrays um, so it's um it can be slow and do slightly unexpected things um so generally and unless you're sort of confident with matrices and arrays my guess would be we're better off sticking with l apply um and again as it says here in data sites we usually work with data frames and not matrices so it's not something what most of us are likely to come across and then I think we've got a quick look at for loops. So a, nice, a powerful programming technique, um, which we've not looked at yet in 
R is actually how to repeat the same process for every element in a list. And quite often we've kind of been doing that iteration in other ways, um, but you can actually specify a loop if you want. So if we look at using walk, um, which is basically going to uh, apply append file to everything in paths, we could do exactly the same thing using a loop by saying for path in paths, so everything in paths, for each path within that set, we're going to append the file path to it. Okay, so we can use a loop to do the same thing. Um, things get a little trickier if you want to save the output. Um, so you can see using paths, we were able to map and actually save the output last week. Um, but it, it is slightly more complicated using loops. But, you know, there are something we can work with. Um, and this is, it basically takes you through this process of how you might do that using four loops um, rather than some of the other iterative functions. And then you can also do a similar thing to create a list using a do call and r bind. So, so that there are other ways of, of actually working with tibbles using these different iterative functions. Um, plots, this bit's really easy. So if you want to plot in base R, if you want a histogram, you just do hist and say you wanted to plot carrots from diamonds, diamonds, dollar, carrot to produce a simple histogram. You can do a plot just using plot. So it's not as powerful as ggplot, but it's a lot quicker and easier to do. Um, so if you're doing sort of some exploratory data analysis, you know, this may well be the way to go. And I think that is pretty much it. So we've looked at base R functions for subsetting and iteration. We've compared how base R there is differs in some ways in certain places from tidyverse commands um, and to how they handle different data structures. Um, we've had a look at loops and also plots. Um, so it's kind of getting a lot more powerful. There's also more complexity in dealing with these things, um, but it's just, you know, and the next stage of the journey. Um, and Olio Femi, do you have anything else to add on that? Okay, I think uh, this is also a good approach uh, for data analysis. Like the last part where we were showing the plot, uh, where we we're using base R to do some kind of uh, visualization. I think that was where I also started until when I announced it uh, to Tidyverse, but it's also good that we uh, familiarize ourselves with the base R, how to do things in base R, because at times we still, we still we, at times we might fall, find ourselves that the only solution to solve the problem we have at hand is to use uh, the functions that are available in base R. But the more, I think uh, the more better way that is very efficient in which people can easily read the code and understand the code. I think that syntax is found in the tidyverse. I think it's a tidyverse because it makes code uh, to be very easy to read because the readability of code is very important uh, in programming. That is, one, that is just what I can just add. But, uh, Yeah, but also thank you very much uh, for presenting the chapter. I think it was very insightful where you show different approach uh, in which uh, we can use in solving uh, problems. I think the last part we have seen uh, the entire workflow of data analysis cycle, we'll have look at programming, how we can automate tasks uh, using functional programming. I think the last part of the book talks about uh, communication where we we look at Quarto, we look at Quarto format. Uh, I think it's very, very useful. I, 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 I will be looking forward uh, to that discussion, but looking at the sign-off sheet, I think nobody has signed up for next week. I don't know if you'll be willing, let 